Thanks for listening to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in American soccer. And don't forget to subscribe. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast. My name is Stephen Jodrin. Joining me, as always, are Monica Fai and Jake Watroba. On today's episode, we speak with U.S. men's national team and Malmo midfielder Roman Gall. We talk to him about the journey that led him to the biggest club in Sweden. Now, before we get to the interview, go ahead and follow us on the Twitter machine at Uncle Sam Soccer Pod. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, wherever that may be, go ahead and do that as well and leave us that five-star rating. Now, let's get to today's show. Alrighty, fellas. How are we doing today? I'm doing good. What about you, Jake? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Snowed in here up in Minnesota, but all things considered, we're doing all right awesome well let's just jump straight to the interview and just some background for you listeners we recorded this early tuesday morning so before the chelsea europa league uh match and yeah so we might sound very tired because it was very early in the morning but it's a great interview a lot of great discussion a lot of good talking points and yeah let's just get straight to it joining us right now is u.s men's national team and Malmo midfielder Roman Gall. His manager calls him a match winner. His fantastic quality makes his mark in games when a team needs it. Roman, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Roman, you've logged some serious air miles, voyaging multiple times over the Atlantic. Um, but let's go back to your early roots. When you made the move to the United States from Paris, France at the age of seven, where was soccer on your mind? Um, at that time, you know, it still wasn't um, anything serious because I was so young. So, um, you know, I, I think I started really engaging into it seriously when I was about seven, when I moved to the U.S. and then I got on an official team. But before that, um, I think it was just messing around and nothing too serious. Roman, you, you joined the MLS academies of Real Salt Lake and D.C. United pretty early on. What was what were those experiences like? Uh, they were great experiences because uh, I was playing, uh, for example, DC United. I was fourteen, uh, playing with the under sixteens. So playing two years up was was obviously a good a good growing process for me and uh, and helped me evolve my game uh, sooner than than most fourteen year olds. Um, you know, and then we had a, a great um, MLS uh, Cup tournament which uh, we ended up winning the whole thing. And then going to Real Salt Lake was also was also great because it was a residency program and I was able to train every day and, and be in that, you know, closest thing to in a European environment. So I think both of those helped me a lot to, to be where I am right now. When you, when you talk about our RSL's academy, I think a lot of people mention that it's one of the better – academies and MLS, and I think you just mentioned that it was very European-like. What were the aspects that made it uh, more European-like than, let's say, I don't know, I hate to compare things, but like DC United's? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it was more European-like because of uh, the residency of it. You know, we, we all lived together. We all went to school together. We all trained together every day. Um, so it's more like you're there and you have one thing to focus on, which is, which is your football and obviously school as well, but, um, it's just more, you know, more possibilities to do in case we want to do double sessions or, you know, just be bonded with the group a little more. I think, I think, uh, in that aspect and in Europe, they're mostly all like that. So that's why. Roman at 16, you left for France and you're quoted in the in four four two for saying quote in France the level is much higher the speed of play is much faster the development starts at a younger age I think they implement more tactical situations and they have you understanding the game I know there are some drills that I was 
doing really young in France that the kids in U.S. won't be doing until they are much older. Do you think your time in MLS academies hindered your growth as a footballer? Um, no, I don't. I don't um, it, it's tough to say because obviously when you go overseas, they've been doing it for a long time, you know, and they have uh, they have the best of the best and. Uh, but we're just starting off, you know, not every MLS team, for example, has the same type of program. So I think it's just different. Obviously, I think if, if I would have been in Europe, just like any other player, you you yeah. definitely and you're in that residency program, you're you're definitely going to learn faster and quicker and and, and mm. you know, learn things better than if you're not in a residency program, you know, so. I think it's just uh, the the different cultures and the developments and uh, how how the setup is right now. Roman, uh, just out of curiosity, why uh, did you decide to go back uh, to France? Um, was that your only option, or did you have multiple other options on the table? Why specifically did you decide to go back uh, to play academy in France? Well, I'm French, so I yeah. think that was. Uh, <laughs> a big thing, you know, to kind of feel at home. And uh, it was a a country that I was familiar with that I had uh, contacts in. So I think for my development, it was, you know, the only um, area we were really pushing for. Obviously, if anything else came along, we would have done it. But I think France was the main priority. And Roman, after uh, a a stint in France, you decided to come back stateside and join the Columbus crew in search of more playing time. Uh, was there any disappointment having to make that move back to America? Yeah, definitely. Because uh, I always wanted to stay in Europe. Uh, I, I had said it from from very young that I wanted to play in Europe. And uh, so, you know, when I came back to the MLS, it wasn't my initial, um, my initial plan. So, of course, uh, a little bit disappointed to, to not be able to stay in Europe, but then, you know, I had to just focus on what was ahead and, and make the most of it. At that age, when you decided to come back, what was the topic or among footballers, what was the conversation of the image that MLS uh, had? Um, I think it was just uh, being able to fall into the right group that believed in you was going to give you your chance. Um, obviously we all know that it's a physical league and, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of, uh, of names coming into the league as well, but I think it's just about, you know, hopefully finding the right team and fitting in the system. When you came back, uh, with, with the Columbus crew, did you, uh, witness, did you ever see anything that was like, Hey, this is a lot different or maybe not a lot different, but a big a difference from when you, uh, we're playing academy with RSL and DC. Um, I mean, of course, yeah, it was different because that was my first professional team. You know, I was actually with the first team and and things like that. But I think, um, you know, I w- I wasn't really comparing either one because obviously there's two different things. But um, you know, the setup for the younger academies were were about the same. Not not where we all saw Lake, but with like DC United, for example. But um, definitely different, just because you're in a more professional environment. Ramon, I want to ask you about uh, Greg Berhalter. Obviously, he was just named uh, manager of the national team, but you had spent some time with him at Columbus Crew. What did you make of your time with uh, with uh, Greg? Um, I thought he was a, a great coach. You know, I have nothing but good things to say about him. Um, he's helped me a lot on the field, you know, tactically, he's very, very smart. And, um, I believe that, you know, with the short time that I was there, I definitely grew and learned, you know, obviously things didn't work out, but, um, you know, I have respect for him and, and I really have nothing but good things to say about him. Uh, could you briefly discuss his playing style and what it means for players when they are in a Greg Berhalter system? Yeah, so he's a manager that that likes to play. You know, he likes to play out of the back. He likes to keep the ball on the ground and 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 you know um, break lines and and beat teams by by being well positioned and and always forming these little connections between each player. 
Um, so I think players enjoy playing under his system because, you know, you're going to touch a lot of the ball, you're going to play good football, and, you, and everyone's going to have their opportunity to, to shine and to, to do what they're good at. He, he finds players and, and, um, and, you know, makes them better in what they're already good at by also, you know, tactically giving them awareness and, and all that stuff. So I think it's a good system. I think one thing that a lot of people mention about Burhalter specifically, as you mentioned, like that that tactical instruction. I think a lot of people, uh, I know a lot of people who, I think Sebastian Legit was one of them who said, I've never been coached like that, like that detail um, when he was talking about the games in the January friendlies. Uh, how was it? How was it really specific as tactical instructions? Because uh, everyone I see have talked to says he's just an extremely, extremely tactical guy. Yeah, it's definitely specific because his style of play, you have to be or else it doesn't work. So, you know, the details need to be there and uh, the focus needs to be there. You know, tactically, everyone needs to be in sync, you know, for, for the for the system to work or else it doesn't work. So there's definitely a lot of demands um, tactically for sure. Roman, have, since uh, Greg has been hired as the national team coach, have you had any conversations with him about expectations but what it would take for you to get a call up back into the side? Um, yeah, he gave me a call and, um, you know, we spoke a little bit. He just told me that, uh, you know, I was doing well and, and to keep doing what I was doing and, you know, that m my time would, would eventually come. And uh, so, you know, it was just, it was just a good conversation to, to have and, you know, speak to him again. Mm. So let's move on. You leave MLS and you end up in Sweden what was that experience like, again, moving back overseas and playing European football? Um, well, that one was also difficult because I moved back to the third division. So, obviously, I was happy to be back in Europe, but then the conditions I was in was, was also difficult, and being back in third division is not the happiest that you're going to be. But, you know, I knew what I had to do. I, I grinded it out, and... Um, you know, I, I was just going to try and keep moving up from there. I told myself that there's only one way to go now, and that's up. What was the biggest adjustment that you had to make, you know, coming, uh, I guess, from America to Swedish football? What was the biggest uh, difference, I guess, or adjustment that you personally had to make? Um, well, in my first club, since it was uh, in the third league, I think the professionalism was definitely a, a big change. You know, it, it wasn't like me coming from Columbus, like a professional um, environment. Um, and then style of play, you know, when you're in the third division, it's it's very chaotic. Uh, you know, it's not as much tactical. Um, so, you know, these are just styles that you have to get adjusted to quickly. Roman, after uh, so after your stop at I hope I'm saying this right, Nico Pings, and then Sunsvall, you land with Malmo. Um, did you ever think you would get to this point where you were playing it for a top side in a country like Sweden? Um, I always I always believed in myself to play for a top side um, in any country. Um, I didn't know it was going to be Malmo. I didn't know it was going to be in Sweden, but. You know that's 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 the goal. That's how you keep the the faith alive. So I always believed in myself to be playing for a top club anywhere in the world. So yeah, I mean when I, when Malmo came and and was ready to sign me, I was very happy. Do do you feel the uh, the shadow of Zlatan Ibrahimovic at Malmo? No, I don't. <laughs> uh, I think he. <laughs> No, he's done his magic over here, and uh, you know, obviously, everybody respects him. And but no, no shadow. But uh, as far as this current season, you guys are are playing Chelsea in the Europa League. We're not too sure when the interview will drop. But how, how are you feeling so far? How how are things going? I feel great. Um, we played the first leg. Obviously, it was a it was a tough game, but you know, we managed to get a two one. So anything's possible on the return leg. Um, um, to be able to play in that game, you know, was obviously a, a night to remember, in my opinion, even though the result wasn't the best. But, um, yeah, I feel great. I think we're going in the right direction. We just won our cup game now. So, you know, we, we keep working. It's been a very tough preseason so far, and it's going to continue to be so. But, 
you know, I think we're all in a in a good uh, direction, and and I feel great. Yeah, a lot of gripes that a lot of MLS teams have is when they're playing in uh, Concacaf Champions League matches, their pre it's it's their preseason while Liga MX is in season. Is that is that the same thing for you guys when you guys are playing a team like Chelsea who has been playing uh, while you guys um, you know are you know just training in preseason? Is it kind of tough? Is it a little bit harder? Yeah, it's tough because if you look at it, they're already in a dynamic of playing every weekend. You know, their their players are fit. You know, they <clears throat> they constantly have games, and then we're we just came back from break, and uh, we have to pick ourselves back up again and and get those games in our bodies and in our legs. And so obviously, it's two different points in our seasons. But you know, uh, we had a very tough preseason, and we we were prepared very well, in my opinion. So. I think it did help us for this game for sure, but it, it's definitely tough because both teams are at different stages in the in the season. Roman, a couple more here before we let you go. I want to talk about your current coach at Malmo. Uh, is it Yuli Rostler? Um, can you talk about how he's helped improve your game? Yeah, he's um, he's definitely helped uh, improve my game uh, as far as, uh, you know, he brings a lot of motivation and passion to the game. So, you know, that side of things, um, you feed off of his energy. Um, so he's definitely helped to push that side of my game and, and also defensively and, uh, um, tactically as well, because I'm in a new role under him, you know, I'm playing more as a central midfielder, I would say, as a number eight. So um, tactically, I, I needed to, to adjust quickly, and he's helped me in that, and he continues to help me as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm learning to improve little stuff in my game every day. Roman, this is the last question before we let you go. You've lived in multiple places. You're a dual national. Where was your favorite place that you've played football at? Uh, my favorite place to play football... Um, I would say, I would say I have great memories when I was in France in uh, mm. Lorient. Um, I think on and off the field, if I had to say, my favorite place to live though is definitely in the U.S. Um, that I just feel like that's more home to me. Um, but yeah, I think my 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 great memories were were in France for sure. Oh uh, well, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, and uh, a best of, best of luck with the upcoming season. Hope that they catch up with you sometime midway to, to see how things are going. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much. Take care. I appreciate it. Bye bye. All right, guys, really interesting interview with Roman. Thank you for joining us on the show, Roman. But guys, what do y'all take? What do y'all make of Roman's thoughts? Um, I think especially the most interesting thing for me was the the academy, the RSL academy, which he compared to as being very European-esque because of residency program. And a lot of the more successful MLS programs to come to mind, FC Dallas and I think the Union, both have residency programs for their academies and are the better academy team. So I mean, what, what do you make of that whole uh, discussion we had about his time with the MLS academies? Uh, I think that's uh, an interesting point. I don't think we get enough insight from players talking about the development. And what you see in, in this case, in this interview, is he did his development here early on, then went to France to continue his development, and then he came here to begin his professional career. So you you see a journey that you might see more often than not in the next several years with the way MLS continues to expand and this market that Europe sees in America with potential future talent. So uh, I think this is great insight into how MLS functions and in broader terms how U.S. soccer functions when it comes to how they handle their youth. I, I, I will say this um, th that I thought was interesting. I know – Steven thinks this was interesting too, was when uh, Roman mentioned that he was a little disappointed when he had to come back to America to play in MLS after his uh, stint in France. Um, I think that's, I don't know if that's really 
telling, so to say. But I, I, I think it's it's nice that we have American players now that just don't want to just settle for MLS. It really shows that uh, Roman's hungry and, and and wanted, or at least wants to improve upon, you know, himself as a player on the pitch. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, like, if you get a player like, uh, what, Serginio Dest at PSV, if, you know, he's been in the academy in the system, you get a taste at European football. I mean, if you have to come back to MLS, like, hey, like, it is what it is. MLS is not the same level as some European football. I mean, we all know that, and I think everyone who watches MLS and watches other football know that as well. So, I mean, I think, of course, if you're a player that's developing and, you know, or was developing in France or, you know, a team in League 1 or, you know, a team even in the Netherlands or in England, you're going to be a bit disappointed and say, hey, I'm dropping down a level to come play in MLS. And I think the situation with Roman is really interesting because the United States isn't his home country. France is. So a lot of different, you know, dynamics playing there. But, I mean, I think it's kind of expected to be disappointed. But, again, you're right, Jake. It's really refreshing as well that, hey, look, the guy is not the happiest, you know, come to MLS and just really hungry and wants to go back and he bet on himself by going to the third division of Sweden. So isn't that what you want to hear though? I was disappointed to come back to MLS or have it even starting out in MLS then clawing himself to the third division yeah. of Sweden and then to That's the what... biggest club in Sweden. Like isn't that somebody is as a coach you sit there and like, okay, this guy gets it. He wants to he wants to be successful. He's gonna do everything he can. Coming to MLS was a disappointment, but probably an important step in his career to test out some professional soccer at an, uh, an early age. No, Stephen, you're right. It, it, that that is what you want to hear. But I mean, let's let's be real here. You know, four or five, six years ago, we had guys like Josie Altzer, Michael Bradley, uh, Jordan Morris who, you know, ha- had an offer in Europe and decided, well, I just got a new puppy. Sorry, I can't I can't go play in Germany. I got to stay home in Seattle, which, you know, if, if that's what you want to do, I mean, I mean, by all means, do it. That's if, if he didn't want to leave his comfort zone and, and, and go test the waters over in Europe, I get, you know, whatever. This is America. He can choose whatever he wants but, to do. But, our, Jake, I think Armand obviously just touched on this, but Roman's dual nationality cannot be overlooked in why he wanted to be in Europe more so than, say, a Jordan Morris. I, I, I think players who grew up in America might be a little more comfortable with what they have here, and they look at Europe as, as a prize. But when you get to Europe, and I, I, Christian Pulisic talked about this, is that every player out there is competing for the same job as you are. In, in, in American sports landscape... Not every athlete is wanting to be a professional soccer player. In Europe, it would seem a majority of athletes at a young age want to be professional soccer players, professional footballers. Uh, the, in- the interesting thing with uh, Gaul is I wonder how many people or a- a players would take the risk that he did and go play in like the third division of Sweden You know, after playing in MLS and not staying in MLS or USL. Uh, because hey, look, the third division in Sweden again, it's not it's not the best. I mean, we've we all we all we all know that, and I feel like a lot more people would would have stayed in potentially USL and developed there and hoped to get an MLS contract at some point because they're comfortable. So I was very impressed to hear uh, that part, and I think you're also right, Stephen, in terms of you know people wanting to come back home again. Look, if if I'm a player and I'm not getting PT overseas hey, why wouldn't I want to develop in MLS? But I think it's a very different situation for Roman because of uh, his dual nationality. Armand, Armand, let, let me... I, I actually think it was better for Gaul to go to the third division of Swedish football and try to make a name for himself there than try to find his way in USL and hope he gets an MLS contract. Because oh, how, many times, how many I times agree. do we see USL players getting uh, MLS None. deals? None. None. He was more likely to rise up the ladder in Sweden, playing in the third division, getting playing time and developing, and then he eventually <clears throat> was sold on to I think it was what Sundsvall uh, in, in, yeah. in the first division, and then later sold on to uh, Malmo. So I think, without a doubt, 
he was better off going to Sweden. I, I actually think it would have been more risky for him to stay here in America and try to find a way um, to MLS via USL. I mean, I, 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 I agree with you in terms of like mobility because it's an open pyramid over there. And, you know, he, if they get promoted, they get promoted, he can move up. Or if a team notices them, they can pick him up as well. And like we said, we, all, we always talk about how USL uh, players aren't really targeted enough by MLS players. And by the way, Aaron Long, who was a USL player, uh, signed what, like a three year that's worth almost $900,000 a year for one of the richest, making him one of the richest center backs. In MLS, just want to throw that out there and say, hey, there's talent out there. Um, but I feel like a lot of players would stay in USL uh, compared to go to like the third or fourth division in Sweden just because I think it's comfortable. You know, and that's, that's one thing we talk about with uh, American players is, hey, you know, like I hate to nag on Jordan Morris because he got paid and he played pretty decently for the Sounders. But look, he said he's more comfortable here with the Sounders than it was for him to go to Werder Bremen. I mean, we see players come back all, all the time to, you know, because it's just more comfortable here in the United States. So I just feel like a lot more players would just go into the USL and be like, okay, you know, I can work my way up and get a, a get a deal there. But I think you're right in terms of, hey, it's probably better for someone to go to a second or third division in Sweden uh, and take that risk. The, their ceiling is higher uh, in terms of uh, where you could land. Armand, let me let me ask you this. We got a Twitter response, or somebody responded to us asking this question: Where does Gall fit into Berhalter's system with the U.S. Men's National Team? It's interesting because uh, he was a winger before, but he said in our interview that his coach is training him as an eight. Um, if it's the eight, it's going to be tough for him to break that because you're looking at a midfield rotation of McKinney, Adams. If you want Pulisic in the middle, Pulisic in the middle. If not, uh, you could you could go through a list of defensive mids and all that stuff that you know play there. But I mean, your your two main guys are going to be Kenny and Adams. They have to. Like, if it isn't, then something is really wrong. Um, and we also, you know, we, who knows? You could see Michael Bradley play there. I'm just saying for the Gold Cup. I'm not saying for anything else. Or Will Trap and this Kel is to Nacosta. Me, uh, Kel Nacosta. So it's really competitive. So I think his best bet's gonna be on the wing. Um, it, it's, it's in most of his goals, most of his performances, uh, assists. Uh, we you see if you go through his highlight videos, have been from the wing. But I mean, because that midfield, that midfield's really congested for the men's national team. So doesn't uh, he, honestly, I think I think a winger is gonna be. Your doesn't best he bet. fit better on the wing if Christian Pulisic gets pulled into the middle? I mean, I'm I'm trying to think of a the U.S. men's national team's depth chart right now. It's pretty. It's pretty hard for me. I think, yeah, I think he does. I think he's a better shot at just making it, making it at, at the wing. I mean, what? Um, I don't think the MLS competition is really there. I mean, January camp, yeah, the MLS players, you got J- Jeremy Abubase and Corey Baird, who are both pretty just good players. But I think Gall could take overtake either of them, and it wouldn't be an issue. Um, so, I mean, I'm interested to see where he'll fit. I mean, you you do see players, you know, play a role for a national team and a role for their club, and I wouldn't be surprised if Gall. Uh, you know, was a winger for his national team over, um, you know, playing the eight spot for his club, especially when you're, again, when you're talking about Weston McKinney and Tyler Adams, two of probably the best Americans right now in Europe. Armand, I think you're definitely right. I think his his best shot of breaking into the U.S. men's national team side is going to be as a winger. You look at the depth chart there, uh, a little bit thinner on the wings than it would be in the middle of the park. But that is it for today's episode. Make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at Unc Sam Soccer Pod. Follow Stephen Jodoran at Stephen Jodoran. Follow Armand Kafai at Armand Kafai and myself at Jake Watroba. Make sure you subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever. Make sure you leave us a five star review and make sure you tell your friends too. Yes. MLS preview uh, show coming up this next episode. So stay tuned for that. And yeah, until next time.